Good morning. Once again, we are grateful to God for this opportunity that we have to come and share this lesson with you. And our lesson will be coming from 1 John, uh, the third chapter, but it will be covering the three smaller books of, first, of John, the, uh, the disciple who wrote three books, three letters, and that's what we'll be covering, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But before we get into our lesson today, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We thank you for being so good to us and protecting us each and every day that you give us life above ground. We thank you, O Lord, for the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon us, O Lord. And we thank you for always the opportunity to read and study your word and gain understanding and grow more in the likeness of Christ each and every day. We give you, O Lord, all the glory, the honor, and praise for all that you do for us and continue to strengthen us and hold us in that powerful hands and give us understanding as we go forth in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> as we stated earlier, our lesson will be coming from the third chapter of 1 John, but we'll be basically covering uh, the three books of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, again, as we go through this Bible in one year. So our lesson will be coming from 1 John, the third chapter, the 11th through the 21st, 24th verse. And our subject will be love one another. And certainly that is a very interesting and good topic that we would learn how to love one another as Christ has taught us to do. As I grow in life and as I understand more and more that God reveals to me, love is a very key factor in the things that we do and the things that we say and be. And if we learn how to exhibit those, that characteristic of love toward one another, because love wouldn't hurt. Love doesn't try to bring another down. Love doesn't do anything but try to support and even be sacrificial to do those things that normally uh, an average person would not do. Love has a greater value uh, than anything else because the greatest love was when Christ laid down his life for us uh, as sinners. And uh, if we would learn how to follow that same example of Christ and learn how to be giving and loving and forgiving, uh, our lives would be so much better. So this is a very good lesson for me today as we get into this uh, this uh, letter of John on love, learn, learning to love one another. Let's read a little bit of background before we get into our lesson today to kind of understand what John is saying to and who, what he, who he is writing to. It says, this letter was written to the members of the churches in Asia Minor. The epistle served as a reminder to the children of God to love one another. The devil is the originator of sin and has sinned from the beginning of time. Those who belong to Satan reveal their essential nature by lying lawless, by living lawless lives. This lawlessness is clearly seen in a blatant disregard for human life. John restated that Jesus laid the foundation on how we should treat one another. When Jesus died on the cross, he demonstrated the greatest, truest, and most unselfish kind of love. His death validated that love is more than just mere word. It must be followed by action. And that's really important right there that, that we learn to understand that just to tell somebody you love them, it's not enough. You have to show it to them for them to really believe it. And that, was, that is what really makes the difference in life. When we say we love someone, our actions should prove our declaration. Displaying love for one another is evidence that we belong to God. Children of God should live to please the Lord in accordance with his commandments. To show indifference to the needs of others is a complete contradiction to the teachings of Christ. In Jesus' day, many assumed that by obeying the commandments, they could show themselves worthy of God's blessings. We see that in Galatians 3 and 2. However, Jesus made it very clear that love was a natural result of God's blessing, not a precondition for it. The commandment to live to love is an expression of how Christ's disciples should act. The disciples were commanded to love in the same sense that the branches are commanded what to bear fruit. And we see that in John 15 and 3, the Gospel of John. So it's very important. Love is the very key factor in us living and being successful as a body in Christ and fulfilling and doing those things which Christ has taught us to do. And, and without love, uh, we would not have the Christ-like attitude and, and the understanding that we need for Christian growth 
uh, without it. And it is very essential and very needed. We just need to learn how to practice it more and learn to do those things that Christ uh, told us that we must do, that we must love one another. And if we do this, then others will understand and realize that we are his disciples. And that's what's important. We can separate ourselves from the world in many ways, but the greatest way to do that is through loving one another and showing the outside world what it means to be on the inside and do those things that Christ has instructed for us to do. Let's get into our lesson. Our lesson starts in verse 11. I always encourage you to read the whole chapter, but our message, our lesson starts in verse 11 where John talks about this love, uh, idea of love, uh, how we should love one another, how it should, should be in our lives. Verse 11, it says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning that we should what? love one another. John's message is clear. Love for one another is an integral part of the gospel message. It is a command that Jesus gave to disciples during the upper room discourse. It also command, it all it, it is also the command that he declared was the second greatest commandment outside of loving God uh, himself. From the outset, love was a vital part of Jesus' teaching. If love for one another was absent in the community, then they were not but following what the ways of Christ. And that's really important. If you say we are Christian and we say we're 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 following Christ, we have to be able to follow the examples that Christ gave. And that greatest example was love, unconditional, unselfish love that we share with one another. If we can't love one another, we always have attitudes or we always have different mindsets that are not good for each other. Then that's that's a good indication that the growth in Christ is not taking place as it should have. And, uh, and that we need to really work on that to love one another. It says in this verse, John states that love should not be an afterthought. Obedience to Jesus' command to love one another as he loves us is expected of everyone who accepts the gospel message. Love shows us that the gospel includes both benefits of salvation and the responsibility of Christians to love one another. It goes hand in hand and it's not separate or tangible to the Christian faith. The message of Christian faith is love, obedience to the command and the imitation of life uh, of Jesus Christ. So, I mean, it's, it's literally impossible for us to live as Christians without love in our beings. And, and like I say, it, it, it is a, that's why this, this is a growth process for us because so many times that we may not, hopefully we won't end up the way we started off or, or we'll be better in the end than when we started off in that we would learn to understand that life situations and as we grow in Christ, that we would learn to handle situations better, learn to do things differently and learn to get along with each other and love one another as we true as Christ truly has loved us. Because remember, Christ gave a lot for us uh, like like what he said, Paul said in one way, we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Uh, we have to understand that this is a very important element of Christian growth and Christian life is love for one another. And this is what John, uh, the apostle of love, is helping us to understand. Now let's continue on to see what John says about this idea of love. He says, look at it, not as Cain, and we're talking about love, don't love like Cain, who was the wicked one who slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his works were evil and his brothers were righteousness. And we know the story of Cain and Abel, where Cain brought his uh, sacrifice for God, and it was rejected, but Abel's was accepted, and Cain got mad. And um, and then, and rather than going back to God, or rather than trying to see what it was necessary and needed for him to make his sacrifice acceptable, he got mad with his brother and did what? He killed his brother. Uh, because of jealousy and because he was angry with what well, because of God's rejection of his uh, sacrifice. And that's what John is saying. We can't be like that. We can't have that nature like Cain because nature uh, that nature destroys and it kills. And we see that in the life of Cain and Abel. Listen to this. Cain is cited here as an example of one who did not show love uh, for his brother. Cain is to characterize as the wicked one. The word wicked is also translated as hurtful or evil and refers to someone who is bad or who could cause harm. John is explicitly saying that Cain belonged to Satan. 
Saying Cain belonged to Satan is John's way of pointing out that the way we treat each other is part of a larger cosmic battle between good and evil. <clears throat> if we are characterized by love, it will affect our behavior. Likewise, if we are characterized by hatred, it will certainly show in our behavior. Hence, the saying that we sin because we are not, because we are by nature sinners, but we are not sinners because we sin. Now, so let me read that once again. Likewise, if we are characterized by hatred, it will certainly show uh, in our behavior. Hence, the saying that we sin because we are by nature sinners. We are not sinners because we sin. And, that's, and what that is saying, we as Christians, we have changed natures. But we do sin, but that don't mean we're sinners because we have been changed from what? A sinner to a saint. So even though we sin, that doesn't make us a sinner, but it still means we're a saint that falls short and have sin, which we have the right to come back and correct that. So we have to understand this process about sinning, but if you're outside of Christ, then you are a sinner indeed. Cain slew his brother Abel because his works were evil. Notice that the Greek word, translated earlier in the verse as wicked one is now also used to describe the quality of Cain's work. Cain's murderous acts was most assuredly not motivated by love, like his brother Abel, but what by hatred. And it's sad to see that when we can get uh, to that point of hatred, even for our own blood kin, that we would take their lives as well as uh, before we will help observe it and do those things that we need to do to bring our, our families together. It's a sad situation when we want to tear apart, destroy, and kill and hurt one another in the ways that we do. Love is not in us at that particular point in time. It says, from the example of Cain, we see that hatred facilitates envy, violence, and murder. While we may not literally murder people, we may assassinate their character and reputation because of hatred. We must avoid hating others, especially Christians, because of their what, murderous and devilish nature uh, of hatred. We got to get rid of that hatred. We got to get rid of that meanness, that nastiness, and we've got to replace it with love. That's the only way that we are gonna be survive as a community and a body in Christ, is that we learn to love one another as we should and as Christ has loved us. It's very important for us to do that. Verse 13 and 14. Look what John said. He says, marvel not, my brother, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised. We know that we have passed from death unto life because what we love the brother. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. And that's the key factor to understand what we've been. This is a scripture that when you come in as a deacon, which I've been through, that they help us to understand how do you know that you have been saved? But this is a passage in verse 14 is because we have passed from what from death unto life. In other words, because now what I love the brother, I no more I no longer hate or have disregard or or have little uh, uh, to say about my brother or my sister. But I really love them and care about their well being. And this is how you know you've been changed when you have that attitude and that whole disposition about you in a different way. Well, a few years ago, as you say, you might have thought different or done different. Now you can approach a situation with a different attitude. This is how we know that we are changed from death unto life. Is why? Because we love our brother. Let's look at this. The world here is representative of all these that oppose God. John is saying that we as Christians should not be surprised because the world hates us. It is the expectation for Christians to love one another in obedience to God Christ's command. Such acts of love then translate into a, into righteousness. Obeying Christ's command to love one another uh, gives Christians an inner knowledge and assurance of their passage from spiritual death unto life. That's what he's saying. That's how we know if we've been saved is because why we love the brother. We, we've changed our understanding and our, our relationship and our assurance and, and our position with how we look at people and how we treat people. That helps us to understand our growth and our transformation into Christ. Love for fellow Christian is a dynamic experience that testifies to the reality of spiritual journey from death to life in Christ. Metaphorically, 
John compares brotherly love as a rite of passage, uh, representative of a significant change or process in one's spiritual life. It is crucial to note that John does not say that one can pass simply by loving others. That would be salvation by works. Rather, his point is that having love for others is evidence of one's maturity and passage from death unto life, I mean death of sin unto life, based on faith in Christ. So love is the evidence and not the means of salvation. So that's what we're saying. If you love one another, that helps us to understand that we have been changed from the dark, dingy person that we was before Christ into now the new life of Christ because we can truly say we love our brothers and our sisters in a sincere way. A nominal Christian who does not demonstrate love has not embarked on the spiritual journey. That person is still in a status state of death. The absence of love for one another shows that one has yet to come alive spiritually. They have not allowed the Holy Spirit to what enable them to produce what the fruit of love uh, to come into their hearts. And that's important. If we're not loving and doing the things that Christ has instructed us to do, that's, that shows a very uh, low growth uh, growth rate and a very low uh, 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 Holy Spirit being involved in our life. Because if the Holy Spirit is really leading and guiding us in the ways that we should go, then we will have a change of heart about the things we do. And we wouldn't do a lot of things we do and say a lot of things if we love one another. That's why it's so important for love to go forth in our relationship. Verse 15, it says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has what? Eternal life abiding in him. In this, an echo of Cain's experience from verse 12, John presents to his readers uh, the serious consequences of hatred and establishes the parallel between hate and murder. Anyone who, like Cain, hates his brother is also a murderer. We'll see why in just a minute. One could assume that this verse means that a true Christian cannot hate his fellow Christian. But it is a fallacy to believe that people of God are incapable of hatred and murder. The Bible records several instances of murder by those who were what? His people. Moses killed, Moses who killed an Egyptian. You see that in Exodus 2 and 12. And David who had Uriah killed to conceal his adultery with Bathsheba. We see that in 2 Samuel 12 and 9. Are two major examples. Having established his length with Cain, John now concludes that hatred of others uh, is the spiritual equivalent of murder and that no murderer is entitled to eternal life. So we may not physically kill our sisters and brothers, but if we hate them with a passion or hate them with so much uh, disgust or uh, just so much uh, 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 hatred, as we would say, then that's just as well as saying that we are killing them physically. And that is a bad thing to do. But look what it says. The word abiding is from the Greek word, which means to remain, last, or endure. It is used here by John, and it's very important. John says that although believers possess eternal life, those who hate or murder do not have Christ's spirit residing within them. Thus, hatred is the equivalent of a moral murder. So we just we just can't stay in a state of of, of uh, hatred and, and, and just ungodly like attitude. Because again, when you stay, when you go from one, when you start off in one state, it, it generally escalates. And like I say, look at the, look at the situation with Cain and, Elbow, uh, Cain and Abel. Cain hated his brother and then it eventually what? Elevated what? To murder. And those are the things that you don't want to see and don't want to be a part of. And you just pray that God will help deliver you uh, from that situation before you get to that point. And as example brought out, you do have some people of God who did commit murder. Uh, but one thing about David, David was always, as the Bible said, a man after God's own heart, that when Nathan the prophet came out and pointed him out his sin, David was quick to come back and do what? And repent and ask God to forgive him and to restore him uh, 
from his uh, sins and his unrighteousness. So as, as, a, as a believer, do we fall short? Do we do things we shouldn't do? Yes. But that don't mean we are a sinner. It just means we fall short and we sin. And if we come back and repent, now don't think that just because we go out and do something that the convenient fix is, oh, I just come back and repent, ask God to forgive me and move on. You got to be sincere about it. You have to really, God, first of all, we can't fool God. And God knows if we're sincere or not about what we're doing. So therefore, if we come back and truly repent as Christians, God can cleanse us up and, and from all unrighteousness and forgive us. And that's the process that we need to do. If we repent and come back, and then God will clean us up. And then we can be a part of God's kingdom and still show love and grow in Christ. And hopefully the next time around, we will handle that situation a whole lot different than whatever we do. And that's very important. Verse 16, verse 16, and it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brother. Let's read that, uh, verse 16, in the New Living Translation, and hopefully get it uh, a little bit better understanding. It says, We know what real love is, because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for other brothers and sisters. Now that's tough one to deal with right there. Because first time we say, I ain't giving up my life, and I ain't gonna do this. But but what John is saying is that's what pure love and sincere love is all about. When we can get to that mindset at least, or get to that point in life, that if we had to get to that point, that we would be willing to make that sacrifice for a brother or sister. Uh, and not, not a family member, but a, but a brother or sister in life. Uh, just like Christ did for us. It says the love of God for others is made known, not just in words, but what in our concrete acts of love. Uh, the Greek word translated as perceived refers to obtaining knowledge. John is saying that we obtain knowledge of the love of God by looking at the life of Christ. Very practically, God demonstrates his love to us by sending his son to lay down his life on our behalf. This demonstration of divine love is the heart of the gospel. Christ gave his own sinless life to pay for the penalty incurred by our sins. He now offers the pardon resulting from this sacrificial act of love and to all who will accept it by faith in him. Divine love is a giving love. God gave his son for love. The son gave his life for love. The Greek word agape, uh, translated here as love, finds its ultimately definition in Jesus' uh, unconditional act of giving. So we see that love, again, is not only a word we say, but it's also an action word. It's one that takes root and does something. And that's how we, um, that's how we know that we can truly, truly say that we love one another even whether it's your spouse or your children or family members or somebody close to you, to tell that person all the time that you love them and never really show them or uh, uh, give them any actions of that love is certainly not confirmation. They may say, well, I know you say it, but I don't really know it or understand. I hear you, but I don't hear you. And, and like I say, all those things have to be uh, accomplished, uh, accompanied by actions, and that's what's important. If Christians follow the model of divine love, then they too ought to what, give something of themselves to express this love for one another. Jesus said there is no greater love uh, than self-sacrificing love. This is why Christians are called to self-sacrifice love uh, rather than to self-preserving love. As beneficiaries, as beneficiaries of this kind of love, it is incumbent on us to love others in the same way. It's a challenging uh, situation for us as, as Christians, but it shows a, a big growth pattern for us if we can do these kinds of things. And that's what's very important, that we love one another uh, by our actions and not just by our words. Verse 17, but whosoever has this world's good and sees his brothers have needs and shutteth up his bowels of compassion uh, from his love, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Now James is going to kind of come back a little bit what what James uh, John is coming back with a little bit what James talked to us about in his letter about uh, 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 feeding a brother when he's hungry. Listen to what James John says. It says John says when someone has the material means to help the needy but refuses to give compassionately, 
The existence of a Christ-like love in such a Christian is open to question. Using a rhetorical question, John shows that God's love does not exist in anyone who can refuse to help those in need. At issue, at issue is not whether God's love loves a person, but whether such a person possesses God's kinds of love toward others. And I'm sure we all have been challenged with uh, with the opportunity or the situation where we're seeing uh, many on the streets or on the corners or, or at certain positions around town that have asked for handouts and, and have done things uh, and, and have asked for us to, people to help. And sometimes uh, uh, you get real skeptical about things because, you know, sometimes people's hearts are not as true as others. And there are some people who genuinely need to help. And, and, and that's why we always have to pray and ask God to give us the, uh, the wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and, and, and be able to uh, understand what we need to do at every situation. Because I do believe that there are some people out there, uh, as we say, scamming or doing things. But then there are people who have genuine needs uh, that we can help address. We might not can eliminate it because of our resources, but we might be able to ease somebody's condition at least for a little while. And that's what's important. And so we have to pray and ask God to give us uh, discernment. And that's the word I'm really looking for in these situations as to what we need to do. But if we can help somebody, John said that we should do that. And that helps us to understand how we can really love our brothers in actions in that way as well too. It says our material possessions are not given uh, to us only for self-indulgence. God commands us to love one another love others requires that we use our possessions to obey the, that command some rewards some regards worldly possession as an end uh in themselves but john says that they are to a means of expressing god's love in us opening the door of compassion in us enables us to what to reach out to others in need so it's very important how we reach out and how we help others uh the greek word uh, literally means, for bowels, literally means intestines, but figuratively means tender mercies or inward affection, and here indicates the compassion uh, is a quality of one's inner emotion. Now we use the similar metaphor when we talk about feeling something deep down in our gut or with our heart. As such, love must be unlocked, uh, must be unlocked it from inside before it can show what outwardly. Anybody can preserve or perceive a need, but but not everybody has what the compassion what to help others. And that's what we have to be very sensitive and very aware about is that when we do reach out to and see see people, if we can, again let the Spirit of God lead you into what you need to do and how you need to do it because there are some good, like we say, some good and bad situation, good in that you can help somebody. And there are bad situations where people really try to take advantage of people uh, uh, in these days and times. And, uh, and, and you really have to be well aware of what it is that you need to do. That's why we need to stay prayed up, read up, and filled up with the Spirit so that we can uh, know what to do. Verse 18, it says, My little children, let us not love in, in words, neither in, la in tongue, but with in deed and in truth. Addressing this reader as little children not only suggests that John is advancing years, but also shows the family atmosphere he is trying to create among his breeders. There is no better institution that reflects this kind of sacrificial love of John is writing about the family. Including himself in the ammunition, he says, let us not love in words, neither in tongue. The construction suggests, like a father giving advice, John was asking them to stop merely talking about love, but show it in deep, in deed and in truth. That's very important. Like we say, we just can't tell people we love them. We have to show it to them. Christian love is more than a feeling. It involves essential ingredients of giving. Many times when people say they love one another, their only real action is from their own mouth or uh, in tongue. If the expression of love that is backed up only by the tongue is not true 
a love like Christ's self in sacrifice and love. True love engages in action, centers on others. The world is tired of passive love. Only active love will be attract outsiders and make them what want to join what God's family. So again, like I say, it's only when we show this love to one another, not just say it, that the other outside world and people of the world will come in and want to be a part of this because they're going to say it's something different and it's something special about that group of people that I want to be a part of. And, and no matter who you are, I even look at a lot of a wildlife pictures and I look at uh, the lion, which is supposed to be the king of the jungle, but as big and as ferocious and as bad as he is, uh, especially as a cub, but even as an adult, they still need that love and they still need that protection and that care from their parents uh, to grow and to be nurtured. And that's what we need too. We just need that care and that love and that nurturing from each other in order to grow and understand uh, what we have in Christ together. Verse 19, and let's pick this up just a little bit. And say, hereby we know that we are, uh, that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. The word hereby, uh, here meaning by this refers to this verse 18 and points to the active expression of love that corresponds to Christ's self, self-sacrifice. When Christians demonstrate this kind of active love, they know they belong to the truth. Uh, which what is truth in these things pertain to God and the duties of man, morality and religious truth. In this parable of the sheep and the goat, the sheep on Christ's right were commanded, commanded for their acts of love toward others and was rewarded according by Christ. And we see that in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. In the future, when Christ returns, he will what, stand before his, we always stand before him to be judged and rewarded according to our deeds. And that's what we have to understand that we will be judged according to all that we've done, but we also are rewarded for those things as well too that we've done according to Christ's uh, will and his command. Verse 20, it says, For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. Let's read verse 20 in the New Living Translation and see how that says. And verse 20 says, Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows what everything. That's what it says. It says the Greek word, um, refers to, uh, the Greek word for heart refers to the heart organ, but here it figuratively notes the center of all physical and spiritual life. Therefore, if the testimony of our heart is, is negative, then we have not been sacrificially reaching out uh, to love others like Christ. Fortunately, God is greater than our heart and knows, our, knows better our motives for service. The Greek word for condemn, uh, which means to find fault, blame, accuse, or condemn. Our motives may be unknown to others, but deep inside, we know our reason. Just as we cannot deceive ourselves, we cannot deceive God for knowing all things. So in other words, God knows us. And I know we always use the expression, God knows our heart, but really God knows. And God can, can understand exactly what you're thinking, what you're doing, what you're perceiving, and whether those things are good toward the brother and assistant that you are directing those things toward. So uh, remember, God always knows everything that we do and we can't fool God. Verse 22, 21 and 22, he says, Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, then we have what confidence toward God. And, whosoever, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. As Christians, we must learn to listen to our inner voice so that we can what, be confident before God. The Greek word for confidence, uh, which means openness or speaking or acting without concealment. It may be easy to deceive others, but God who knows our heart. But there, so therefore, God, uh, John says that if our hearts are open and honest, we can go confidently before the throne of grace and petition God. And that's important. We can't fool God about our motives, about intentions, about anything, but God, God knows us better than we know ourselves, and that's what we have to understand. Verse 22 discusses the benefits of a positive testimony of the heart. If we have a confident heart, 
because we keep God's commandment and do those things that please him, then we will also be assured that we shall what? Receive whatsoever we pray for that is what? In line with God's will. And that's important. We just can't pray for any and everything. It has to be in the will of God for our life. And that's what we have to understand. Yes, other people may have other things or do other things, but if that's not the will of God for you, us or for, for, for your life, then that then God will more. I'm sure God would not grant that to you in your life, uh, because He knows the detriment that sometimes things can cause us uh, more than what we might think it might benefit us. So God knows what we need in our lives. It says John's point is that disobeying Christ's command to love can hinder our prayers. So what we should obey God. We should we have to do everything we can because definitely. We don't want our prayers hindered. We want our, our prayers and our and our requests to be answered as much as possible. And we thank God for being wiser than we are in knowing what to give us and what not to give us. And that's very important. Verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave commandments. In this verse, John provides the crux of his epistle. When Christians act in obedience, self-sacrifice and love, we gain confidence toward God. Faith in Christ and love for one another bring us into a new relationship with God where we become his children. Believing on the name of Jesus Christ, including accepting the fact that he uh, is the Son of God who gave his life to pay the penalty for sin, uh, reconciling us back to God. The second part of the commandment is to love one another. The subsequence is important. The command is that we both have faith in Jesus and also love one another. Faith in Jesus Christ is the basis of our new relationship with God, and love for one another is the expression of that saying faith in us. So again, if we really want to know if we've changed from life to death, we got the love the brother, and we got to, we got to uh, do those things that that, that line up with Christ in our lives, line up with the Word of God in our lives uh, for what God and what Christ has put down for us. Let's close this out with verse 24. And it says, And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he has given us. To keep God's command, which includes loving one another, is, is to abide in him, and to have him abide in us. A reference previously in verse 15, the word abideth means continuously to be present. This mutual indwelling characterizes the relationship between God and his son Jesus and points to their unity. The believer's maturity in dwelling in God is also a reference to the familiar union between God and his believing children. God is presented is present in believers through his Holy Spirit who dwells in them. And we see that in Romans 8, 9, and 11. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit within believers, they have a sense of belonging in God's family. Paul says, for we have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. This context shows that by the Spirit we know that we are the children of God. Since God is love, his children should be the characteristic, should be characterized by love. Just as we have love members in our earthly family and enjoy getting together with them, so believers should enjoy helping others if they have what? The love of Christ in them. So this is John's message as we close our lesson out today. It's about love. Is that we should love our brothers and sisters and we should love those outside uh, of the Christ and do what we can because the absence of love uh, is, 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 a very, uh, uh, is a very powerful thing that, that helps us to understand that we can't totally fulfill what God would have for us to do if we can't love one another. And I can say the great takeaway from this, way, from this lesson the way for me today is, is that if we just can't show that love as we should, and we all have to grow. We all have to get to that point. And, and, and that's why this is a journey. This is something that we don't do overnight. This is something we don't gain 
in one or two days or a few years. This is a lifetime of growth. And to say that we can love the brother when we previously did not, we can say good things or support one another or share with one another the goods that God give us, that shows us our growth and our development. So let us learn to love and, and pursue this idea of love and that Christ has set the example of when he died for us on Calvary's cross, that we may make sacrificial love for each other as well too. God bless you, God thank you. And until we have this blessed time to be, do this again, if it be God's will, you stay safe and God bless you. Thank you. If you enjoy this program, call us right now, 404-688-6680 or send an email to info at mountpleasantatl.org. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church is a congregation full of life and love for everybody. Would you consider sowing an offering? Whatever God lays on your heart to give would be a blessing to the ministry. Thank you for your support. Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia.